I, I'd like to just turn to Mady Horning for a moment. She's the Director of Translation Research at our center. She can perhaps talk about some of the studies that people are anticipating doing with these types of samples. There are clearly um, a host of questions that have, uh, that, that remain, that we're dedicated to, uh, per, to be pursuing. Um, along with other, uh, along with other investigators, we know, as Ian uh, alluded to, there appears to be at least in a portion of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and immunoreactivity, differential immune profiles. We don't know what those mean. We don't know why they why they exist. We don't know which subsets of patients may be most likely to have those uh, those sorts of indices. But with these sorts of study designs, we've done such exquisite characterization of patients. We've controlled for so many factors that we know could alter um, the, uh, you know, infectious agents in the, in the uh, catchment areas and, uh, you know, age and sex and all of those other factors so that we can begin to pursue what the indices might be that may lead us to some of the etiologic factors. And additionally, there will be studies at, uh, of epigenetics, um, looking at gene expression and, uh, and so different you know. RNA species that may regulate the uh, expression of genes and provide further light on the pathogenesis of this syndrome. Hillary? Um, just one second. One second. I'm just getting you a microphone. Oh, okay. The origination of the discovery of XMRV was by, as you know, John, uh, Joe DeRisi and Don Ganim at UCFS. And also the, uh, there were uh, a number of papers uh, published um, in 2008, 2009 on relating XMRV to prostate cancer as well, um, the, or associating it, not saying it was the cause, obviously, but um, n nor did the, your paper, uh, Mikevitz and Rochetti's paper, say that it was the cause either, uh, by the way. But I, I guess my question basically is, um, why so much emphasis, so, so much urgency to uh, retract the connection between XMRV and chronic fatigue syndrome? And this... Uh, there, there, there haven't been any calls for the retraction of the prostate cancer papers that were uh, uh, where XMRV and uh, prostate cancer were associated. Just curious. So I, I think that's a it's an interesting question. I don't see any delicate way for us to address it, and it's somewhat off point. So I'll be happy to talk with you about that offline, but not online. Other questions? Please. Yes, this is Deborah Woroff again. Um, I just, uh, I'm, I'm very impressed and I understand the points that you've made about the parameters of what's been done and what will be done. Um, as someone who's had this disease for 23 years, uh, if I look at the IRS tables, for life expectancy and subtract from that the 20 years that are supposed to be sacrificed to this disease, I discover that I'm going to be dead in 45 days. <laughs> now, with that in mind, I wonder, uh, and, and we all know that this disease and its investigation has taken a lot of bad turns along the way and has been subject in various departments, actually not involving any of you, but in other departments, to a great deal of negligence that has held it back. What do you think are the optimum things that can be done to really speed along the progress towards a cure within my lifetime? So. I've been involved with a number of organizations that have been successful in promoting research. The most successful, of course, uh, was the HIV AIDS community. And thereafter, 
the autism community. And, uh, you know, there are others that have been more successful, less successful. There is no question but that your political leadership will respond to pressure. So um, this may not be a very popular thing to say with, with everyone and, uh, you know, and because at the National Institutes of Health we like to focus on basic science and applied science without talking about specific diseases. But the fact remains that if you say there's going to be a certain amount of work that's going to be focused in a particular area and you can focus it in that way, then people will work in that area. So I would encourage you to try to motivate, you know, your colleagues, people with this disease, uh, related diseases and their families and loved ones to, you know, to request additional support in these areas. This is what happened with autism and it made a huge difference in the investment at the level of the National Institutes of Health and even in the Department of Defense. Um, again, this is very difficult for people who have a chronic illness, which is debilitating. It's very difficult to be, you know, to be, you know, aggressive in pursuing that sort of support, but I think that's really what you can do. What I don't want to see happen, and this is why I'm somewhat reluctant when we start talking about examining organs and such, is to have something where people want to donate themselves, their bodies and such. I would strongly advise against that, and I can personally tell you right now that I won't touch it. Okay, so there are examples where people have done things like that, uh, in science, and, and I, won't, I won't encourage it, I won't condone it, and I won't analyze it. So um, I'll, we will only analyze samples from people who are going through some sort of a, you know, a, a, a clinical trial where everybody has been consented, and, you know, we're not doing any harm. Okay, this is absolutely key. Harvey, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think what's going to accelerate things at this point is that there's been a shift in thinking. Uh, to date, it's been looking at, at organisms, uh, mostly viruses, as causes of this disease. And everyone has sort of petered out uh, with further investigation. But now, I think we're thinking of the uniqueness of the host and why do certain people respond to common viruses in a different way. Uh, why is there a hyper response to uh, probably cytokine production, other things released in certain patients in response to viruses that uh, most people handle differently? And I think now with the technology, of it, you, can, you can look at all these things simultaneously, as Ian says. You can look at the entire genome for viral and infectious agents, but you can also look at host response genes and, and cytokine productions and, and everything's imaginable now. Uh, the, uh, all the ohms can be looked at simultaneously. So I think the answer is going to come out of that approach and it will happen more rapidly than, uh, than it has happened to date. I, th I think it will, but as, as a not someone who's not an employee of the federal government, I can tell you right now that if you make noise, people will have to respond. The, you know, the, the National Institutes of Health, the whole scientific enterprise in this country is frankly under in jeopardy because we may be moving into sequestration and this is going to have a huge impact. On the sequestration? Oh, there's, you know, what happens if we don't come up with a plan for the budget? Oh. The projected, the projected reductions in the budget for the National Institutes mm -hmm. of Health are going to be staggering. So people do have to have the resources to do the work. So this, is, so this is a time, in fact, when you can be very aggressive and vigorous about pushing back and saying, we need good science, we need good medicine in this country, we need to push forward in that fashion. And although my, my colleagues who are federal employees can't say that, they, they will agree with me in private. Um, I, would yeah. like to, oh, I would like to say something about that. Mm. Ian and Harvey and Mady were talking about the response of the host and the immunoreactivity they find. Yeah. In the last, it's a propitious time for you to be proactive because 90% of what's known about the immune system was discovered in our lifetimes. Mm. When I got into the field and I've tried to publish a paper on a cytokine from a T cell, all the reviewers said, came back and said, you're crazy. T cells don't make cytokines. Mm. So you see what's happened in the last 35 years? 
it's a good time to be proactive because what we know about the innate immune system, which is the orchestrator of the immune response, is much more known now than it was known 30 years ago. So the scientists need to use the new technologies like Harvey said, mm -hmm. but the organization can be proactive because there's much more to be learned now. More than it was known five years ago, not yeah, that's years right, ago, four years ago. And, and now we have these samples to go back and yeah. look right. as we discover new things. And, and as the next-gen sequencing Correct. techniques that's are right. allowing us to do deeper and deeper sequencing integrated with these other techniques. Just from Harvey's remark, I didn't quite understand whether you meant that there was already work going on in the sequencing, or not sequencing, in, in this area of cytokines and so forth, or you already know of someone who's planning it? I, I just didn't understand the timeline. Yes, I think uh, yeah, we're, we're our, our yeah. senior member here <laughs> yeah, we're, we're is already, already, to, already progressing yeah. in this direction, uh, and, and others will too. It's just, it's just such a logical way to go now. And the technology is what allows it to happen. So then it does get down to money. And these things are very expensive. So where is that money going to come from? And, and if I may add, last week um, a patient organization brought it to my attention that last week the FDA took the lead in, in this regard at the direction of Mr. Obama, uh, President Obama, and said that uh, uh, this is a serious and life-threatening disease and encouraging drug development in that category, bringing industry and um, into the field, biotechnology, big pharma, um, and, and giving them the opportunity to begin to, to look for drug targets in this realm and, and, and produce new therapeutics and new clinical trials.